morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, really glad everyone could come today. My name is Yvonne. I'm the founder of the Agricultural Campus Plant-Based Society. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, we just founded this uh, club last month and uh, we hope that we will have some really interesting discussions which have an academic connection and which uh, will teach us something about plant-based lifestyle and diets and also of course this comes about food production, how it connects to our other courses. And we are really happy to have Dr. Margaret Robinson here today. And uh, yeah, I'll just give over to Margaret and uh, enjoy this book. Thank you. Hello, uh, in Mi'kmaq Kwe, or sometimes Gwe. Uh, I'm honored to be here, and I want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the Dalhousie Agricultural Student Society, the Agricultural Campus Plant-Based Society, and especially to Yvonne Varner for having me here. Um, so my name is Margaret, and I'll start by introducing myself a little bit. Uh, I'll talk about how a Mi'kmaq girl from Sheet Harbor ended up going vegan, and uh, why that's a little a bit of an odd scenario. And I'll talk a bit about how I see my um, dietary choices and other choices related to Mi'kmaq values. And then I'll talk a little bit about how I see those Mi'kmaq values overlapping uh, settler vegan values. Uh, lots of time for questions and discussion, and I'm looking forward to hearing about all of you and what kind of work you do. Um, so I'll start by telling you a bit about who I am. I'll start by introducing myself in Mi'kmaq, and then I'll switch over to English. So, Gwe Nindeli Wizi Muglish, Lewet Eskikawage, which is, hi, my name is Margaret, and I'm from Eskikawage, uh, which is more or less approximately Halifax County area. Um, my parents are Heather McLean and James Robinson, both of Halifax, but I grew up uh, in Sheet Harbor since the time I was an infant. My parents lived there in the woods. Uh, at the time, as a young person, I thought, oh, why did you move to the middle of nowhere? There's nothing cool here, and we can't even get cable. And as time went on now, as an adult, looking back, I realized what a gift it was to grow up on the land, because the experiences that I've been able to draw on, uh, having spent days and days and days in the territory uh, of the Mi'kmaq, uh, has helped me in my own search for identity and uh, my own abilities to understand the concrete practice of specific values. Um, so a little bit of the, the academic side. Uh, I went to high school in Sheet Harbor and then I went and did my undergraduate in English and Religious Studies at St. Mary's University. I went to the University of Toronto for my master's and my PhD. Uh, my area of focus was theology, looking at uh, how gender and sexuality categories develop in Catholicism. So if you want to discuss that at some point down the road, I'm happy to chat there. Um, but uh, one of the things I did as part of my PhD was I did a research project. And I caught the research bug. I was so into the ability to talk to people about their own experiences, to see the patterns and the themes across a number of different people, and to uh, figure out what those patterns and themes can do to help people live better, happier, healthier lives. So when I graduated from U of T, I went into the research field, uh, starting off with LGBTQ health research, uh, expanding into uh, indigenous LGBTQ health research, and then into more general Indigenous research from there. So I worked at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, I worked at the Ontario HIV Treatment Network, and then I had an opportunity to move home to Dalhousie. And that was very exciting. <laughs> so uh, since 2015, I've been uh, here at Dalhousie, and um, just in July, I got hired on as a tenure track uh, professor doing a Canada Research Chair which I just got the news uh, at the end of October was approved. So uh, I'm now a holder of a Canada Research Chair in Reconciliation, Gender and Identity, wow. although it's under embargo until May. So until they can do uh, all of their governmental bureaucratic celebration stuff, uh, it's mom's the word, uh, but I'm allowed to tell people in some contexts, and this is one of them. 
when you say here, do you mean here, here, or Halifax here? Uh, here in terms of uh, all of, all that is Dalhousie, <laughs> the many okay. tentacles of Dalhousie. Uh, so it's, and also here in terms of Mi'kma'ki, because mm -hmm. uh, okay. in terms of the CRC pitch, uh, I see my work as, as regional to the territory. Uh, so some of that's going to include going to uh, even Maine, which is included in Mi'kma'ki, uh, and uh, hopefully parts of uh, Newfoundland, which are increasingly included in Mi'kma'ki. Um, so the, the territory shifts and changes over time in terms of where it covers, but um, that's part of my, my new stomping ground uh, for, the, for the CRC. So I'm a coordinator of the Indigenous Studies program, and one of the things I do as part of that is think a lot about how do we live as Indigenous people in contemporary society. Often when we talk about indigeneity, there's a tendency to assume that if it's authentic, it has to look like it did in the past. Um, and this is a problem for indigenous people. So for instance, we don't really see the same dynamic with settler folks. So as a settler person, my background is uh, Scottish on my mom's side. So uh, if I'm talking to other people of Scottish descent, uh, they don't necessarily think that I'm less Scottish if I don't speak Gaelic. They don't necessarily expect that I'm going to know every element of Scottish history. And they don't treat me as somehow less authentic because of that. Uh, they might look at me a little odd if I take my tea the wrong way. Um, but there are some pieces of history that they see as those pieces carry forward to a contemporary setting. And then there are other elements that they see as, no, that's best kept as part of our history. With Indigenous cultures, there's a tendency not to do that. Um, particularly settler governments and settler courts have tended to assume that if Indigenous people do something different than they used to in the past, then they're no longer the same Indigenous people. So for instance, a court case in the uh, Wet'suwet'en uh, areas of BC um, with the Gixan and Wet'suwet'en people, the court ruled, uh, tried, well, the, the prosecutors tried to argue uh, against the land claim that uh, the people putting the land claim forth were a different indigenous people than, though, than their ancestors because they drove cars and ate pizza, uh, therefore making them no longer indigenous and therefore no longer able to put in a land claim, no longer eligible. Uh, so how we see ourselves as moving from the past through the present and into the future has serious ramifications for how we get treated in uh, terms of claiming territory. So when I talk about indigenous vegan values, there is a serious risk that if Indigenous people take up a lot of vegan values, uh, we may actually lose dramatically uh, in court cases in terms of being able to assert that we've had continuous um, possession of the territory. So I acknowledge there are dangers in even talking about how do we move Indigenous uh, contemporary practices closer to our traditional values um, even if they look different than what we did in the past. So uh, happy to touch on that again later. So I'm an Indigenous woman. I'm Mi'kmaq. My people have lived in Mi'kmaq for about 13,000 years. Um, when Canada was celebrating its 150, I remember seeing a meme go around of a coffee shop that had the Canada 150 Mi'kmaq 1300 or something uh, signs up. And so there are there are benefits to that long tradition. Um, and my veganism has been shaped by the philosophy that develops out of this territory. Um, and so part of that is a relationship with the land and the people who share it with me. And a tendency when we say people to mean not only the human people, but to mean other animals as well. So uh, Mi'kmaq elder Wanda Whitebird talks about the people who walk, the people who crawl, the people who swim, and the people who fly. And in Mi'kmaq, we refer to those people using the concept of Mesit Nogama, which means all my relations. A lot of other indigenous communities and other indigenous nations have a similar concept or even use the same words, all my relations. As an indigenous vegan, uh, I often get asked to talk about, so how did that happen exactly? Because uh, there's not a lot of us. I think in my uh, four or five years of talking about indigenous veganism, I've met five indigenous vegans total. Uh, and three of those were related to one another as a unit. So, so there, there's not many. Um, but 
I do think it's interesting to look at uh, how do we understand veganism in relation to indigeneity. So while it's possible, of course, to be a vegan and not be an animal rights activist, or to be an animal rights activist and not be vegan, uh, I tend to see them as pretty similar. So I'll talk about veganism when really I mean uh, all of the different identities that coalesce around a general caring about animals and their lives and what happens to them. Um, whether those people are uh, actively not eating meat, temporarily not eating meat, or still eating meat, um, the spectrum <laughs> that radiates out from the idea that animals are important. Um, and because hunting is part of the culture of many indigenous nations, settlers involved in the animal rights movement have tended to see indigenous hunting as part of a pattern of the systematic destruction of animals, uh, their habitats, and their lives. And that framework is all part of a bigger problem about how animals are treated as objects for sale and consumption. On the flip side, indigenous communities tend to view animal rights activists, particularly done by settlers, since that's who usually does it, as part of an ongoing genocide of indigenous cultures and indigenous people. So settler protests about indigenous hunting are seen as part of a broader system of cultural destruction. So it gets put in the same category as residential schools, um, the destruction of indigenous languages, criminalization of indigenous practices, or the apprehending of indigenous children by the state. So when settler rights activists talk about indigeneity, uh, indigenous people usually frame that as powerful, privileged people trying to control less powerful, more oppressed people. So why is this a big idea, a big problem if settler vegans and indigenous people don't get along? Um, well, as someone who belongs to both groups, it's a problem for me personally. Uh, I sometimes hear colonial or racist things when I go to settler vegan events. So for example, I was driving in a car with some activist friends and we passed through the Tonawanda Indian Reservation. Um, and they started discussing indigenous hunting rights. And at this point, the driver of the car explained that the only way he'd support indigenous hunting rights were if indigenous people were forced to use bow and arrows that we built ourselves. And he was attempting to freeze indigenous culture in the past without holding settlers to the same standard. Um, and so this, this becomes a problem because um, a lot of the treaties we signed do not take technological developments into account. So for instance, the um, Haudenosaunee signed a treaty with the Dutch and later with the English uh, for a section of hunting ground. Um, and in exchange for that, settlers were allowed access to the territory. Um, settlers then built Chicago and Detroit and Toronto and Hamilton uh, and uh, a number of other large industrial cities in what was originally that preserved hunting territory. So that territory the Haudenosaunee had negotiated to have shrank and shrank and shrank. And that's why they have a yearly protest in the Short Hills Deer Park in Hamilton um, where they go in and hunt deer because the hunting territory they agreed to uh, has essentially disappeared. And so all that's left is this protected area of uh, what the settlers who live there see as their provincial park. Um, so the alienation of settler activists from indigenous people is uh, a fairly long-standing problem. And it's also a problem if you're interested in or committed to the well-being of animals like I am, because it keeps the two groups from working together and prevents us from recognizing where we have common ground on issues like genetically modified or trademarked seeds versus wild or traditionally cultivated seeds, where I see settler and indigenous people working in solidarity, like they do in New Brunswick sometimes to oppose fracking, or like they do in North Dakota at Standing Rock Sioux Reservation to fight the Dakota Access Oil Pipeline. I notice they're able to work together when they value something in common as well as oppose something in common. So there's an important piece about uh, having shared values that I'd like to talk about. I'm sure certain settler vegans uh, actually hold dozens of values in common with indigenous people, but uh, I'll talk about three. Uh, the first is honesty, the second is humility, and the third is respect. And these values form part of a larger set, larger set of values, sometimes called the grandfather teachings. Uh, how many people here have ever heard of grandfather, grandparent teachings? Okay, a few of you, great. Um, so these vary by nation. Uh, I learned about them while living in Anishinaabe territory, and so I learned a particular set of seven 
Um, but people have called them the foundation of North American indigenous belief. They're sort of a, a, a set of principles. In uh, Mi'kma'ki, they have also seven of these, although they describe them a little differently. The seven grandparent teachings I learned are love, honesty, humility, respect, truth, wisdom, and bravery. In Mi'kma'ki, they say patience instead of bravery, maybe because uh, the Mi'kmaq have lived with settlers for much longer than everybody else has. So uh, we've learned to be pretty patient. I've heard courage also in place of bravery. Yeah, so uh, it, it shifts depending on uh, who the person uh, giving the list is, um, but that also is uh, a traditional part of indigenous teaching, that sometimes the message is crafted specifically for the listener. So I'll, uh, I'll focus on all seven of the values, but the three I think relate most to the well-being of animals that share our territories um, are the three I'll, I'll focus on. And when I see them appreciated and uh, expressed by settlers who are involved in the animal rights movement, uh, that gives me hope and optimism because I think there are lots of ways that we can build on those. So the first of these is honesty. And by this, I mean taking a clear, hard look at the decisions that we make about food, uh, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, how those decisions impact us physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, we often are encouraged to think about how do we impact other people, but we're often less encouraged to think about how do the choices we make impact ourselves? What are the, the emotional costs or the psychological costs of particular practices? And so I mean being honest about the power dynamic that shapes and determines the agency we're able to exercise in the world. So we sometimes talk as if anyone can do anything they like whenever, and in reality, most of our choices are severely shaped and sometimes even curtailed by uh, what we're able to do in the moment. So what I see us having in common in terms of indigenous folks and settler vegans is um, and honesty when we talk about how our choices impact all our relations. So I'll give you a quick story about how honesty uh, led me to go vegan. Uh, it's not usual for indigenous people to be vegan, and it's really not usual for Mi'kmaq people to be vegan. So even among indigenous nations, there are some that were mostly plant-based. So a lot of farming nations, for instance, the Dene, uh, the Iroquois, they, uh, anyone who farmed corn, bean, squash, what we call the three sisters, um, they have a, a pretty plant-based diet, sometimes subsidized by other uh, meat-based foods, but in general, pretty plant-heavy. Um, here in Mi'kma'ki, my ancestors ate a diet that was 90% animal products, mostly seafood. So it's a little unusual. Uh, there's a big movement now among indigenous people to return to traditional diets as a way to decolonize the body, to uh, eliminate diabetes or gallstones or similar problems that emerge when we start eating um, processed foods. And so sometimes when you talk or do research about indigenous food sovereignty, you'll see a lot of people returning to traditional diets. And so for the Mi'kmaq, that would be seafood. Um, so uh, in December of 2005, uh, I was living in Toronto, and I had just gotten one of those letters from the university saying, congratulations, you're about to graduate. Please move out of residence as soon as possible. And I thought, oh, great. So now I have to find an apartment. So we went looking and I found my uh, dream apartment uh, in uh, downtown Toronto at the corner of Kensington Market in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. How many folks are familiar with that area of Toronto? Okay, sweet. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, um, it's a very different culture when it comes to food. Mm -hmm. um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, the Kensington area is uh, historically Jewish, then Portuguese, uh, then Caribbean, and so there have been a number of different cultures that have brought their food to that region. Um, I was brought up on supermarket meat, uh, which comes dissected in white styrofoam containers, and it's all covered in plastic wrap, and it's hard to imagine looking at, say, a chicken breast, um, especially if it's one that's been cleaned of bone and all those other icky parts. Um, it's hard to imagine that was ever attached to a living person or a, 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 an animal. Um, and so it's not really a representation of what meat actually is. It's designed to help you forget what meat is. As a kid seeing a chicken breast, uh, I didn't think of it as something that had been living. Um, the packaging helped me forget. 
And in Kensington and Chinatown, uh, they don't do that. <laughs> they don't. Uh, uh, they don't do that at all. Uh, they sew animals as bodies and as parts of bodies. So there's a pig head or an entire goat hanging in a window. Um, and the chickens have heads and feet. Uh, the fish have teeth and scales. There are live crabs and buckets. Uh, so the reality of eating meat is extremely visible there. And seeing that reality every day brought to my consciousness something that had been bubbling at the back of my mind for a while but that I never, con I never permitted to come to the front. And that was, I'm eating dead animals. Uh, sometimes it would pop forward unwillingly where I'd like find a vein in a chicken breast and be all squicked out and then not eat chicken for a month or so until I kind of forgot about it again. But after a while, uh, it was hard to forget because the way they sold meat there just didn't let you. And so, um, the turning point for me was Christmas of 2007. It had been a tradition in my partner's family to do a fish chowder for the holiday. And I was working on my dissertation, or I might have been involved heavily in an argument online where somebody was wrong and needed to be told. Um, <laughs> but I was distracted, and I forgot to buy the fish. Uh, and so I didn't have any of these long, white fillets that go into making the fish chowder. Um, and so suddenly it was Christmas Day, and all the markets in Kensington were closed for the holiday. So I went to one of the stores in Chinatown, because they don't close for Christmas, and I got a fish. And instead of a clean white de bone filet uh, and a clean white styrofoam package where you just move it from the package into the chowder, um, no, I got a whole freaking fish. Um, and... He asked me something, and I think it was, uh, do you want me to descale it? And so I just said yes, and he ran a machete over the side of the fish. Uh, at the time, I didn't understand what that was doing until I got the fish home and realized, oh, this thing is like a serious work project here. Uh, it was covered in protective scales, and I didn't understand that fish scales were that strong. And... Um, I didn't have the tools for dealing with this situ situation at all. How many people here own like really good kitchen knives, like Hannibal Lecter quality kitchen knives? Okay, I'm not one of you. <laughs> I had like a knife sitting in a drawer, <laughs> uh, rattling around with all the other stuff. So it was dull. And I soon found myself elbow deep in this fish autopsy, trying to find out where are the fillets inside the fish's body. Um, and eventually it became clear to me, fish don't have fillets, they have muscles, and they don't come apart. And so as I was trying to hack this fish to pieces, I suddenly realized this isn't meant to come apart. Um, and for me, that was a big moment. I realized the fish wasn't for me. It hadn't been somehow designed for my chowder. It was designed for its own life. And for me, that was a big turning point moment. It took me another few months to get my shit together, um, but that was a big moment. Um, and then that summer, we stopped eating meat entirely. A big part of why we did that was that we also got cats. Uh, first we got two, and then we get another one, and then we get another one, uh, as that kind of happens. And interacting with them reminded me that there was a someone in there. Um, so, you know, the first cat was different as a person than the fourth cat, and they just weren't interchangeable. And so each individual animal um, made me start thinking. And the, the combination of the fish and the goats and the pigs and the cats and the crabs uh, all came together. And I had to be honest with myself about what it was we were doing when we were eating and what that was going to mean. So I had to ask myself, okay, if you're going to continue eating meat, how are you going to deal with this new knowledge? And I realized I'm perhaps a lazy person and I don't want to continue eating meat because I didn't want to have to try to do all of that mental gymnastics it was going to take me to keep doing so. And so I stopped eating meat. And I told myself initially, this is a weight loss plan where you don't have to count calories and it'll be great and easy. Um, and it wasn't a weight loss plan at all. Sure, I felt better, um, but my body didn't change in size. Um, I felt more energetic, I felt happier, um, but I wasn't the skinny bitch the books promised I would be. 
Um, instead, I encountered a whole new series of problems, most of them social. Um, but the activity of not eating meat also opened me up to some of the psychological things I had been doing in order to eat meat. I'd ignore the elements that reminded me it was someone's body, like the veins or the tendons. Um, and so I got honest with myself about how I had created these walls in my mind to enable me to see animals as objects in some circumstances and as people in others. And once that illusion was gone, I had to acknowledge that there was going to be an emotional and a spiritual price if I was going to keep eating animals. And so for me, the honest answer was no, I, I'm not going to do that. And so I went vegan and... Uh, once you move through the world not eating animal products, um, you start drifting more to the margin of food socializing, and you meet other people who are hanging out in that margin. So I start meeting other vegans, um, usually in the kitchen, looking to see, is there any food in here that we could eat? Because um, I've been to events where like the vegan food plate is also strangely uh, gluten-free. Uh, or I remember one of the conference I went to where my meal was an apple and a granola bar. Um, so it, it becomes a different world uh, of food options, um, not because there's less vegan food, but because we don't tend to include vegan food in, in our planning. So it was, it was more a socially constructed marginal experience of food. Um, but meeting other vegans meant that suddenly I had people I could talk to about this and they could tell me their stories and I could see ways in which it was similar or it was different. And so that sheer commitment toward uh, recognizing and speaking the truth as we saw it uh, emerged for me. Is this is a thing that we've both had to do. We've had to face uncomfortable truths about ourselves and about the world that we live in. Um, and I was a little humiliated to discover some of it boiled down to what my dad would lively refer to as, ah, oh, circle of life shit. It's like, okay, so yes, things will all die. It doesn't necessarily mean I have to be actively involved in killing them. Um, the second value that I started noticing coming to the fore for me was around humility. And by humility, I mean the ability to know yourself as part of a web of life and not as the top of a food chain. So... This became really apparent as soon as I started telling other people uh, that I had gone vegan. Uh, a lot of previous people, friends that had previously never talked to me about their food choices, suddenly began to explain to me why uh, not eating meat was not an option for them, as if they needed to somehow defend this choice. And uh, a lot of what they would tell me had to do with their own view of themselves as at the top of a food chain that there's a competition amongst all animals, and to win it, you must eat the others. Um, and I thought that was interesting, um, especially in the way that it seemed to me to correspond with um, views about there are different types of human beings, and some of them are better than others. And so I started seeing similarities between how people would frame cultural supremacy or white supremacy, and how we tended to frame species supremacy. Um, and then the more I learned about Mi'kmaq worldviews, as I started realizing that uh, being a Mi'kmaq person in Anishinaabe territory, I suddenly woke up one day and realized I know more about the Anishinaabe worldview than I do about my own. Um, so I started immersing myself in Mi'kmaq stories. And my first point of access for that was the internet, because it was free and it was available, and I'm an academic, and that's often where we go first. Uh, and so I found the works of Silas Rand, who had been a minister with the Mi'kmaq and who uh, lived among the Mi'kmaq and wrote down a lot of their traditional stories. And so I read through all of those, looking to see not only what do people do in the story, but why do they seem like they do it? What are the values? Uh, what are the practices embedded in the story? Um, and then I branched out and started looking at uh, stories that people had captured more recently. Um, and found some of those, uh, different versions of the same story, and compared and contrasted, uh, and started doing some of that as part of my academic work as well. And so what I noticed was that the Mi'kmaq perspective on the world was not a uh, pyramid in which humans were at the top. In fact, if there was any kind of contest like that, they would be putting humans at the bottom. Because it quickly became apparent in a lot of these stories that I was reading that um, human beings were seen as the most inept of the animals. 
We don't have sharp teeth, we don't have sharp claws, we don't really have protective armor. All we've really got going for us is our ability to learn. And where do we learn uh, and how to survive in uh, the territory? We learn it from other animals. And so the Mi'kmaq, uh, and other uh, indigenous nations do this as well, but as I was learning, the Mi'kmaq frame the human being as the most, uh, kind of like the, the sad animal <laughs> who doesn't really understand what's going on a lot of the time and has to catch up to the others. And so if there was any kind of a competition, we would be losing. And so that sense of uh, the way that they actually view the human being as part of a web of connection, reliant on others, more than a leader of others, um, that got me thinking about how, what does this mean for my own relationship to food and my own relationship to other animals. So I'm told in the Anishinaabe language the word for humility can also mean compassion. Um, and so I started thinking about what, what role does humility and compassion have in my own life? Uh, I went to a sweat lodge with uh, Vern Harper, who was the elder for the Center for Addiction and Mental Health at the time. And I'd never been to a sweat lodge before. Um, they weren't really part of Mi'kmaq culture traditionally, um, but Mi'kmaq people have started doing them since uh, we often in exchange cultural activities with other nations. Uh, and so some Mi'kmaq folks have picked it up. Well, I went to one in Ontario, in Anishinaabe territory, run by the Anishinaabe. Um, and uh, I heard a little bit about them, but it was very different from experiencing it. Someone gave me a tip and they said, so if you find it hard to breathe in there, put your face close to the dirt. That's where it'll be coolest, the heat rises, uh, there's oxygen in the soil. And I thought, oh, that sounds scientific, that sounds appropriate. Excellent, good tip. And I got in there and it was excruciatingly hot. It was like being in an oven hot. Um, and I immediately stuck my face in the dirt and spent the entire hour of the sweat lodge with my face in the dirt. Um, and this is the moment I realized I have not been living with humility. Um, it was a moment when I realized my connection, uh, survival connection to the earth and to the soil and to the uh, breathable air in that soil was now going to be my primary experience for the next 60 minutes. And I came out of that sweat lodge with a very different attitude to my place in the world. Um, which I maybe think is sort of the purpose of those kind of activities. But it got me thinking a lot about my childhood. And so I thought about the role of compassion and humility in my childhood. I grew up in the woods by a lake, and most of my interactions with animals were with animals that depended on the lake in some way. So deer, porcupine, I uh, even saw a couple of bears, lots of loons, fish, and frogs. One day after a big rainstorm, my dad came in the house and he said, Hey kids, I need your help. A frog laid a bunch of eggs in this puddle out back, and it's drying up now. And if we don't move them they're into the pond, they're all going to die. So for the next two hours in the hot sun, we move these gelatinous frog eggs and these squirmy little tadpoles from the shrinking puddle into the pond, from the puddle to the pond, the puddle to the pond. And it was exhausting. And I remember as a kid thinking, why are we doing this? Um, but looking back on it now, I mean, that summer, sure, there was a practical benefit. The more frogs we had, the less bugs we had, uh, the less I got bitten by mosquitoes that summer. Um, but to my dad, the fragility of those little frog eggs and those future frogs mattered in the same way that our own fragility as human beings mattered. And so for me, that was a concrete experience of what Masit Nogama means. Uh, all my relations. It's about being humble enough to acknowledge that we have a mutual vulnerability in the world that we live in. And when indigenous people and settler vegans can unite in humility, then I think we can start to challenge the way that the world denies that animals are our relations. That is, we can start to challenge speciesism. The third value that I see having in common that I think is important is respect. Um, and by this I mean, that settler activists share with indigenous people a respect for non-human life forms. And while we might share this value, I think we express it very differently. So uh, if you've taken the time to come here today, I assume you have an idea of how respect for animals is part of your own philosophy. Um, so I'll say a little bit about how I feel it factors into Mi'kmaq culture. Uh, quick show of hands, how many people have ever heard of Blue's Cap? Awesome, okay. Um, so, you may know then, Blue's Cap is the Mi'kmaq cultural hero. He's sort of like a Superman. 
Uh, he's smart and he's honest and he's generous and he's respectful and strong. And when I was looking to connect with Mi'kmaq traditions and Mi'kmaq values, he was in a lot of the stories I read. And one of my favorite is a creation story. Uh, I first read the one by Stephen Augustine and then have since read others, but uh, some of the details are usually the same. So in our creation story, uh, it says Boo's cap was formed from the red clay of the soil. And my own ancestors come from Lennox Island from PEI, so I tend to think red soil, PEI. And initially, Goose Cap doesn't have mobility. He's trapped on his back in the dirt. And this tells us, I think, how dependent we are on the land. And so when I read that line, I thought, oh, like me with my face in the dirt in that uh, sweat lodge, this is about the territory is literally the source of our life. Um, in Mi'kmaq, when people say where they're from, it's the same way that they would describe a plant springing out of the soil. People say, I sprung from. And so the creator in the story frees Blue's cap, um, and then the first thing he does is thank the creator for having given him life. And so I took this to indicate that the basic attitude toward life should be one of gratitude, of humility. Um, and then the creator makes an old woman from a dew-covered rock to be Blue's cap's grandmother, and she agrees to provide wisdom in exchange for food. And in both the stories I read, she explains that she can't live on plants and berries alone and needs meat to survive. And I thought this was interesting because initially when I read it, I thought, oh, it's this sort of apologetics for meat eating and why does it have to show up in this otherwise really nice story? And then I thought, wait a minute, I've, I've been lucky enough to have been trained in hermeneutics of suspicion and reading between the lines. And I looked at this and I said, well, what was Gleef's cat eating before she showed up? Because the introduction of this idea that you can't live on plants and berries alone kind of suggested to me that this was not self-evident to Blue's Cap. And so I thought, is this, an is this a subtle way of saying we have a vegan Blue's Cap? Um, in the stories I read, kind of. Uh, now, later stories have Blue's Cap hunting, and some of them even have Blue's Cap uh, have uh, excuses for why it's important to kill animals. Um, but in this particular story, uh, type, the, the creation story, uh, it did seem to open this possibility of a vegan Goose Cap. So the grandmother explains she needs meat, and so Goose Cap calls his friend Martin. Uh, Martin is an animal like a weasel or a ferret, the American pine martin. Uh, they're kind of adorable, actually. They're sort of like a tiny little teddy bear. And Goose Cap asks Martin to give up his life so that his grandmother can live. And Martin agrees because of his friendship with Goose Cap. And so for the sacrifice, Glooscap agrees to make Martin his brother. And there are lots of Mi'kmaq stories featuring Glooscap and Martin. Sometimes Martin is uh, an actual animal. Sometimes Martin is a small human child. And so this switching back and forth between human and animal uh, is distinctive to Martin, but it's also something that we see in other Mi'kmaq stories, suggesting that there's something about viewing the human on a continuum with other animals rather than uh, being in a different category. So philosophically, we would say it's not a categorical difference. It's not ontological. It's not difference in what their, their essence is. It's just a, a difference of circumstance. And so you do see some Mi'kmaq stories where humans turn into animals and vice versa. So in the creation story with Glooscap, um, Glooscap's grandmother breaks Martin's neck. And immediately, Glooscap is super upset about this and starts to be all distraught um, and changes his mind and says, you know, I don't think this is a good idea after all. And Glooscap's grandmother feels really bad for him. So she asks the creator for help. And uh, in one of the stories, Martin comes back to life and runs away, leaving another body of another Martin behind. And this reflects the way the Mi'kmaq tend to see animals as reincarnating. So uh, in hunting traditions, if you don't treat the body of an animal you've hunted properly, it won't let you catch it next time. And it'll tell all its little animal friends not to let you catch it either, and you'll starve to death. So um, the character of Martin continues in the story, even though technically they're now eating a Martin. So Glooscap feeds the Martin to his grandmother, and the story goes on to introduce us to other uh, family members that get created and to particular feasts associated with them. So when Glooscap's uh, mother, for instance, gets created, uh, her feast is of plants and berries. 
When his nephew is created, his feast is of fish. Um, so each character is associated with a type of food that the Mi'kmaq traditionally uh, used. And so when I read these stories, I thought, this is interesting, because the animals are presented as willing to provide food, but requiring, uh, in exchange for that, respect. The respect specifically given to a brother and a friend. And so when we say all our relations, we're talking about a relationship of respect and kinship. Another story tells about a Mi'kmaq family close to starvation during a harsh winter who pray for food. And in response to this, a moose comes out and offers them a bargain. He tells them if they kill a moose only when they absolutely need to, and if they make tobacco offerings and use all the parts of the body, and even treat his bones as sacred, then he'll always return to feed the people. But if they disrespect the moose, then he'll leave and never return. And to show respect for the moose, the Mi'kmaq use as much of the animal's body as possible. So they use the hide to make clothing, moccasins, and to wrap the exterior of the wigwam. They use the tendons to create thread. They use the bones and antlers to make needles or hunting tools or fasteners or dice. Uh, they use the moose hair for embroidery. And then once the bone marrow has been eaten, the Mi'kmaq would pound the moose bones to a powder and boil it to reap a fat that produces a medicinal soup. So all the parts that can't be used have to be buried. And so there are different ways that uh, you're supposed to indicate that you have engaged in this. Uh, one is by laying tobacco for the body of the moose and offering a prayer of gratitude when it's first killed. Uh, you're supposed to take the dew flap, which is the little sort of rubbery piece under its chin, and hang it in a tree to tell the other animals and the other moose that the moose has been uh, collected in a, a ceremonial way. Um, there's a particular uh, ceremony that some people will do for the moose. But the premise is that it's different than trophy hunting, for instance. Now, most Mi'kmaq people um, don't hunt. Um, most of us get our food from grocery stores. And I don't know anyone who puts down uh, tobacco or who holds a pipe ceremony when they buy food from Superstore. So the view of animals as siblings remains, but each Mi'kmaq person expresses their respect for that relationship differently. So when I look at the case of the story of Blueskap's grandmother, uh, or of both the moose and the starving family, and I realize that I live in a world where I don't need to eat meat to survive, that suggests to me that I'm then not justified in asking them to die. Based on these stories I looked at, I said, um, if I'm going to show that relationship of respect and kinship, uh, I can do that best by being vegan. The social forces that gain advantage from colonial exploitation benefit when they separate settler and indigenous people and treat us as opponents, and when they encourage infighting instead of collaboration. But Mi'kmaq philosophy asks us to make decisions with the next seven generations in mind, uh, focusing on our shared values instead of the things that make us different, particularly our practices. So we can unite on issues that affect the web of uh, life that us and all our descendants depend on, issues like the impact of fish farming on marine ecosystems, the pollution of medicinal and traditional food sources, and developments like the Muskrat, Muskrat Falls uh, hydroelectric dam in Labrador. Nigma elder Medina Marshall teaches that the seven grandparent values come to us at different stages of our life. Ideally, as children, we start out with love and we move on to develop honesty, humility, respect, and so on. And she proposes that when we live all seven of those values, we become an elder, regardless of what age we are. I like this idea, and so I think it's important to join in solidarity in um, our own regions with people who share those same values so that we can become elders together. The, uh, the thing about Mi'kmaq culture and Mi'kmaq values is that you can't just access it through a story. So as much as I did enjoy reading our traditional stories uh, in text form, uh, that's not the way they're designed. Stories are designed to be told interactively, to be told at particular times of year. Particularly, particular stories relate to what's going on in the sky, what's going on in the environment around us, or what's going on uh, interpersonally even. So uh, some people find this infuriating. So uh, sometimes you'll ask, I remember asking my grandmother sometimes for advice about something or asking her about a particular element of culture. And instead of getting a very clear answer, I got a story and was left to my own devices to figure out from the story, what's the answer to my question? And there were times I just wanted to like say, scream and say, you know, just answer the damn question, woman. <laughs>
Um, but it's not about being told the answer. It's about figuring out the answer on your own for yourself. And the things that an elder will tell you in a given story relate to their relationship with you. So what they think you're ready to hear, what kind of person they think you are, what stage of your life you're at. Um, and so some of those stories change depending on the audience. So there is no one correct textual version. There's no canon of Indigenous storytelling. And trying to pull values out of a story and treat them as if they're timeless um, is not an ideal technique to use. Uh, and the results from that kind of work need to be checked against community, uh, against relationships, and against family. Uh, so I went to my community members, and I went to my family members, and I said, so here's what I kind of notice. I went to documents that Mi'kmaq community members had created together, talking about sustainable hunting practices, or taking stands on um, Mi'kmaq fisheries. And I looked to see, historically, where are the places in my own community that I see breaks in our own cultural transmission? And so one of those places where I saw breaks was when we introduced the hunting trade, uh, the fur trade, and uh, almost hunted the beaver to extinction. So I look at that and I say, how do the people who uh, see Martin as a brother and a friend hunt the beaver to extinction? How is that possible? And what I concluded is that um, the relationship with the settlers that were asking for beaver pelts and the relationship to the consumer goods we could get uh, through selling those beaver pelts became more important to us than the relationship with the beaver. And so I think that has been a lens that I've used to examine a lot of issues. Um, some of those issues relate to consumer culture. Um, the Mi'kmaq have a value about sustainability, um, but what they really mean by that word when you break it down linguistically is avoiding not having enough. Uh, it's not about accumulating a bunch of stuff. So a bunker full of cans is not a good <laughs> expression of Mi'kmaq value. Um, Mi'kmaq tend to want to live um, starvation avoidance techniques, really. Um, so uh, it's, it's changed how I view even things like, uh, what are my retirement plans? How will I invest? Um, some of those decisions that we might not think of as food related um, are related to the values that actually determine what we eat and how we eat it. Uh, and it's helped me realize the ways that particular practices that some of my vegan compatriots see as, well, this puts me in an innocent spot, um, maybe doesn't put me in an innocent spot because uh, it's I began to realize there may not be any innocent place to stand, um, that if I choose not to wear leather shoes, well, what will my shoes be made of? Are they made of petroleum products? That's not great for the environment either. How do I balance the various levels of guilt and complicity that even tiny daily choices um, result in? And so it's about trying to keep those key values at the forefront of my mind and use them as a lens for decision making with the acknowledgement that sometimes my decisions are not going to be good. Sometimes they're going to be poorly informed and sometimes they're just going to shift where uh, the bad things happen. So I visited a friend in Toronto recently uh, who knows me as long as I've been vegan and longer and he said, uh, so did you hear about avocado? And I said, what about avocado? And he said, oh, I just watched a documentary about it. it. They're all connected up to the Colombian drug cartels or something. And I'm like, okay, so I haven't heard that before. But I have before thought about who is picking the food uh, that I eat. Where, whose territory does that food come from? Is that territory stolen and therefore that land is uh, being used by people who do not uh, belong in that territory? And am I just blithely sending them my money thinking I'm being a good person because I eat broccoli instead of fish? Um, those decisions are hard to work out. And I don't think there's any uh, ideal, perfect way to live it. Uh, so I'm happy to hear from you about how do you balance those competing goods and competing evils? And uh, how do you figure out where you're going to be standing? I'll say uh, thank you, Emigma. It's Walali Ok. Thank you.
much, Dr. Robinson. Um, yeah, let's uh, have a little discussion now. Does anyone have a question for Margaret? So I have Dirk Pakilani. Well, 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 I'll look. Although, if you're saying it to one person, it's Walalan. I, I, I have to put that one, Walalan. Um, I, oh, thank you. Mm. Thank you for all of that. That was um, personal and profound, all of that together. One of the things I like to remind myself is that being a human, we exact a footprint. Mm -hmm. No matter what we do, we're going to have a, a, a consequence on the planet. But to the extent we can, lovingly and gently be aware, make ourselves aware. So one of the best things we can do is inform ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we can't overwhelm ourselves because it's big, like just the example you talked about avocados. They also have a higher footprint for them than compared to tomatoes. So, mm -hmm. you know, so there's many things for us to monitor. Um, and we try to live harmoniously as best we can. So I, I wonder for you, when you talk about um, some of the grandfather's teachings, uh, seven principles by which we live, and how they might change over time, how they mm -hmm. might change under circumstances. Do you have any um, wisdom and thoughts? Sure. Uh, so one of the things I like to do is use uh, the two way seeing approach. Um, so what this usually means for me is drawing on both sides of my ancestry. So seeing what, what seems like the best of the wisdom from the settler traditions that I inherit from my mom, and what seems like the best of the wisdom from the Mi'kmaq traditions I inherit from my dad. And one of those is around time. So when indigenous people talk about time, they tend to frame things in a much longer time frame. So for instance, if you read a news story about the ochre crisis from a Quebec newspaper, it'll start off with the town of Oko chose to build a golf course. If you read that same news story from an indigenous newspaper, it'll start off with um, the the Mohawk lived in this particular territory because they were forcibly moved there. The uh, Jesuits made an agreement with them that they would take care of the property and do the paperwork, but not own the property. They then sold that property to the town of Oka um, without permission from the Mohawk. And so the timeline of the story begins much, much earlier, um, and it goes much later. So when indigenous people tend to end the story, um, it's usually thinking like, generations and generations down the line. Whereas uh, in a separate news story, it's like it, it ended three seconds ago. You know, I tune into CNN or Global or something to see like, what's going on right now? Um, because that's the shift in focus. I try not to attach values to those differences because I find that they both offer something distinct and useful. Um, so when I look at linear time versus circular time, I find, again, a helpful way for thinking about how do I make the decisions. Indigenous linear time um, doesn't really happen as much. They tend to see time as cyclical. So uh, the Mi'kmaq calendar is based on moons. Uh, each moon is uh, named for what's going on with the animals at that time of year. So frogs laying eggs, for instance, is the name of one of the months. Um, in fact, if the things that happen in the environment change, they change the name of the month. So the Penobscot folks uh, had a month, uh, their name for January used to be the cold is great. I don't know if they meant like great like awesome or like great like whoa, it's really cold. Um, but after a certain point, they changed the name of that month to it's hard to make a living because uh, their traditional food sources were inaccessible because of industrialization. So, uh, the, I, I guess for me, circular time, when I look at animals particularly, it changes things because um, if I go to an event and I'm never going to meet any of those people again, uh, you can be a different person. <laughs> you can, you know, if you piss somebody off, well, you're never going to see them again. Uh, if you accidentally put your foot in your mouth, uh, you, know, you know, you can shake it off and uh, try not to think about it again. Um, but if you know you're seeing all of those people again in a week or in the, another month or every year at this time, uh, that's a different situation. So for me, the difference between like guest lecture and teaching the same class every week, um, I'm, it was nerve wracking. I knew like going into a classroom, these people are going to see me every week. 
Uh, they're going to see if I get fat. They're going to see if I get slim. They're going to see, you know, if I screw up one week, they I have to go back the next week, and they're going to see me again. Um, they're going to remember what I'm wearing, and like, did, you know, I started thinking, like, did I wear these pants last time I lectured? And so, it creates the sense of ongoingness of the relationship. And so, I, when I think about what does the idea that animals are reincarnating bring to that relationship, I think it's a sense of ongoing responsibility that you can't just have a really terrible thing you did to that animal that time just disappear because it's going to keep coming back because you're going to be seeing that animal again and your ancestors, your descendants are going to be seeing that animal again in perpetuity. You can't get away from the others. This is kind of the message. Uh, in Mi'kmaq, there's no word for goodbye. It's just see you later. So I think that responsibility that comes with reincarnation as a concept uh, in circular time um, helps me with a different lens. At the same time, uh, I think the benefit of the settler lens with you're never going to see these people again. Every life is its own special, individual, important life. Uh, that creates an urgency and an irreplaceability to every single life. And so I think when you bring those two together, that can make really interesting and, and dynamic ways of approaching the kind of decision making we have uh, that we end up doing regardless of whether we're using ethical frameworks or not. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I want to touch upon your uh, your great knowledge in, um, of uh, gender identity oh, and sure. sexuality issues. Um, as you know, um, I'm a Judeo Christian. Judeo Christian history and especially what the settlers brought here is very been very patriarchal and really it's only been recent in recent history that we've started giving more uh, rights to women and you know mm -hmm. feminism has risen uh, but I don't know uh, within the uh, Mi'kmaq or within the Mi'kmaq what the relationship between men and women was mm -hmm. and how would you see uh, whether whether there's a difference in compassion or what was the same and how that may help us and the rest of society kind of move forward. Because it seems like within the animal rights and animal welfare world, that really I've been seeing a lot more females mm. and a lot more women coming forth and kind of using that more compassion. And we need to get more men and males <laughs> on board. And it seems to be that really old school patriarchy that we're kind of fighting against that you don't need to be this tough male. And I don't know if in Mi'kmaq culture or if they have if that's an issue. It is, yeah. Um, it is a great question. Cause, yeah. So what I see looking at settler culture is I notice there's an association between masculinity and meat eating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, football, super playoffs, uh, the, lots of meat eating coming out. One of the, you're supposed to offer all this food up for these particular Thanksgiving holidays. It's all meat heavy. And this association that somehow if you're not eating meat, that your masculinity is just going to start dropping in like a temperature or something. Uh, that there's um, that expectation that men eat meat has a very long history in Europe. Uh, so even in ancient Greece, most women were vegetarians, and if people eat meat, they were usually men. In fact, they had jokes about women who eat meat and then want to sleep with other women as a result of it. Uh, so it's. Their, their view of meat eating was that it has a masculinizing effect. It's not just a thing men do, that it's a thing that makes men men. Uh, and I see a bit of that in Mi'kmaq culture around moose hunting. So one of the ways that you could establish that you were man enough to get married in Mi'kmaq culture was to show that you could kill a moose. So if you could take down a moose uh, as a hunter, that shows you're able to provide for a family. Um, and so there is a certain association between um, food, particularly large animal hunting, and masculinity. That said, most of the Mi'kmaq men I know have never gone hunting and have never caught a moose. Um, and so that expectation is no longer culturally as relevant as it once was. Um, as a result of residential schools, a lot of indigenous communities got regendered in ways that were not traditional for them. So, for instance, to the Diné, um, women were traditionally the farmers, but when they got forced to go to boarding school, uh, all the men had to learn how to farm, and the women had to learn how to do homework, like sewing and needlework and that sort of thing. 
Um, and so the men were being forced into a role that to them was feminine. And the experiences that people have as a result of that, like in terms of their own gender identity, um, it's caused all kinds of problems. So a lot of the um, styles of violence that we see in indigenous communities is directly related to those changes around gender and place that happened as a result of residential school. Um, but even earlier back, um, you know, when uh, settler authorities first showed up, uh, if the community was matriarchal, they didn't want to negotiate with women. It's sort of like if you knock on a door and somebody's little kid answers the door and you say, you know, are your parents at home? Uh, because you don't negotiate with children. They have no decision-making power. Um, well, in Europe, women didn't have decision-making power either. They were like children. And so the uh, shifts in government structures, in uh, interpersonal expectations that happen when cultures are forcibly uh, shifted from a matriarchal structure to a patriarchal one, uh, or even from an egalitarian one to a patriarchal one, uh, those are profound. Uh, that said, it's hard to talk people out of doing stuff that they see as just the way it is. So even though uh, we have a tendency to have, well, even though for like the last 110 years, uh, the Indian Act forcibly pushed women out of indigenous communities. Uh, for a long time, they weren't even allowed to vote in their own indigenous elections. They were only able to vote in Canada since the 1960s. Um, if you were indigenous, you couldn't vote in a federal election. Uh, so all of those things should have pushed indigenous women right out of power. But when I look at Mi'kmaq culture, I see the opposite. So in my family, my grandmother was in charge. And little kids get a pretty quick sense of who's in charge in the space. Who do they go to to ask for stuff? And who can overrule whom? Um, and so when I went to friends' houses, I was really confused. Because it was like, why is your dad telling your mom what to do? Um, and, you know, where, where are the grandmothers? Um, and it seemed like a very odd thing to me. Um, whereas I was used to women being in charge of stuff. And so when my grandmother died, I actually sent my cousin a message on Facebook and said, who's in charge of the family now? Because uh, I needed to know. <laughs> and she said, oh, it's our, your cousin Bunky, or your, or your aunt Bunky. And I said, oh, well, why is she? Because I expected there might be some sort of, um, I don't know, indigenous cultural knowledge required. And no offense to Aunt Bunky, but I always sort of thought of her as more of a settler person. Uh, maybe it's the red hair and the freckles, <laughs> but uh, she, I didn't see her doing a lot of indigenous stuff. Uh, and so my cousin just explained, well, she's the oldest girl. I'm like, oh, this is a matriarchy thing. Now, I've heard other people argue that, no, actually, the Mi'kmaq weren't matriarchal. They were led by a series of Segama or uh, river people who were in charge of a particular territory and its access to food. Um, but I think in any indigenous nation, there are differences in terms of how you exercise power. And uh, who gets to make decisions about food is an important position. So in a lot of indigenous nations, women got to make decisions about where food went. They might not have been hunting the food. They might not have. They might have been gathering food. Uh, often, indigenous nations had uh, very gendered roles for people. So women did this, men did that. Um, but then you also had often people who had a gender in between, uh, who would do both or either. Um, so in some communities, uh, for instance, the Dene, uh, before settlers uh, missionized them, they had four different genders. Um, after the missionaries. Uh, after the 1930s, really, uh, what they had looks more like any settler gender system. And is it true there um, is a third gender within most First Nations called um, Two Spirit? People so usually call it Two Spirit now. Who are, uh, as we refer to people in homosexual, you know, homosexual. Um, for the for indigenous communities, it's less about sexuality um, and more about uh, gender roles. So, for instance, in some communities, um, men and women have different language dialects. Mm -hmm. And the third gender people would learn both dialects and would mediate disputes. Um, so the, that would be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Diné have a, uh, they have like a six hour <laughs> creation story. One of the stories has um, men and women getting in a fight. And they decide, screw you guys, I'm out of here, and they separate. Uh, the men go off and hunt, and the women go off and farm. And 
the story sort of told from a male perspective, because the, the next piece of the story is that the women were too busy masturbating and forgot the farm, and therefore ran out of food and were starving. Um, and the uh, men were all doing fine because they could continue to hunt. Uh, in fact, they were even doing better than before, um, except all of the work that women used to do was being done by the one two-spirit person in the group who was sick of that plan and said, I have to get these groups back together and negotiated a peace between them. Um, so the women stopped starving and the two-spirit person stopped having to do all the hard work themselves of cleaning all the animals and so on. Um, and uh, then everyone lives in peace. <laughs> um, but I think the, the idea that there are different roles for people depending on their gender um, can be potentially really uh, negative experience. Um, if you don't have a way to say, you know what, that's, that kind of role isn't for me, and I'm going to do something different. Um, and most indigenous communities that have gendered roles usually have a way for people to move between them or to occupy a middle place. Uh, it's just not usually about sex. Uh, for indigenous people, it's you, the assumption is usually that anyone might sleep with anybody, and it doesn't make you a particular type of person. Uh, so if you if you were a guy who slept with another guy, that doesn't necessarily change the kind of labels that would be applied to you. Um, if you were a guy who wore women's clothes, then that changes you socially. Um, and so there are different expectations related to it, or how you might perform in ceremony, for instance. Um, but yeah, they, indigenous cultures tend to be uh, a little more relaxed about sex than about gender. And so, uh, I mean, that changes dramatically once they've been Christianized. So sometimes they're extremely fundamentalist as a result. Um, but pre-contact stuff, it's, it's usually a little more relaxed. Wow. Thank you for the question, Mike. That was a great question and a great answer. Um, yeah, does someone else uh, have anything to ask? So I, I myself ran into to Mi'kmaq women recently in Halifax, and um, they were scholars, and uh, uh, they kind of felt offended by the idea to stop hunting and fishing, mm. and also taught me about that they um, taught about uh, taught me a little bit about aliveness in mm -hmm. plants. So they kind of suggested that it's the same value or a problem to kill an animal and to kill a plant. So what do you can yeah. tell us about uh, that? So uh, Dr. Joseph Couture, who's a Cree elder and scholar, says that there are only two things you need to know about being an Indian. One is that everything is alive. Mm -hmm. And the second is that we're all related. Um, and so I do see that hyper, from a settler perspective, it's a uh, tendency to overscribe life to non-animal life forms. So uh, I get, sometimes get told I'm anthropomorphizing uh, when I say, well, you know, plants are also alive <laughs> um, and you know, maybe have personalities, so uh, trees particularly, but, but other plants as well. And I remember as a little kid, I must have absorbed that value because uh, for a long time I was anxious about even stepping on rocks. And I remember my dad saw me like kind of trying to hop from gravel pile to gravel pile, and he's like, what the hell are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm trying not to step on the rocks in case they're alive. And he said, oh, well, here's how you tell if something is alive, and went through the traditional, like, you know, does it reproduce, does it breathe, does it eat kind of uh, shopping list. Uh, and so it was hard to tell with rocks, because, well, maybe they do reproduce, there's lots of them around, uh, and I don't see them all the time, so maybe they do eat, and, you know, on a long enough timeline, perhaps they're expanding and contracting, and so, as a person who engages with philosophy and theology, I do start to look at, like, okay, so if the universe breathes, and, and then I met some vegans at a conference who were bacteriologists, and that blew my mind again, because then they explained to me, well, you're not just a you, you're actually your own ecosystem filled with other cells that do not come or originate with you at all, and so what is our responsibility to that ecosystem? And it, it's, it's almost more complex than any single person could ever take into account. But yeah, there, there is, I think, a, a difference in terms of how indigenous people here view 
plants, and even ascribe aliveness to geographical forms, so mountains, um, lakes, rivers. Uh, in New Zealand, they have a river that has a recognition as a person. Well, at first that seems weird until you realize, well, we also do that in settler culture with corporations. And they don't actually have any physicality. They're an idea. <laughs> Yet they can have legal standing as a person. So it's... Uh, Unaccountable legal standing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also the god <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Can I ask um, another question? Yeah, for sure. I just, uh, and, and kind of, kind of follow up on the binary thinking mm -hmm. that we bring. Because I, I, I love so much of what you say. I mean, I'm touched deeply by all your wisdom, but um, particularly the thinking about how everything is connected and um, we're a continuum, you know? Mm -hmm. um, even gender is a continuum. It's not male, masculine or feminine. Like, we're all endogenous yeah. beings. So how, it, how binary thinking and really it's either this or that. You know, we either eat or we don't. Mm -hmm. um, like, the, um, that strong, un giving almost, almost relentless stance. So there's something about bravery and, and courage, but there also is something about compassion and humility, as you were saying. So they, they sometimes um, challenge each other, I guess, as we do. Parts of ourselves challenge other parts of ourselves. You know? Yeah, I mean, human beings have a drive to want to know. Uh, we, we want to know exactly where we stand on stuff sometimes. And so the binaries can be really attractive. Like, is it right or wrong? Just tell me the answer. Just tell me, like, how do I be good? How do I do the right thing here? Um, and instead to get told, well, you know, it's all about balancing this with that. Or, or, sometimes that's really frustrating if you're just looking for something that's a lot more clear and black and white. Um, and so binaries can be really attractive that way. Uh, and I, you know, everyone, I think, has moments where they kind of resort to a binary to help them out on something. Um, but all of those things change culturally and uh, depending on the, the time period we're in. So my cousin Lisa asked me after a presentation one time, so if um, traditionally women in our culture took care of the kids, and uh, am I being too spirit then if I'm out shoveling the snow while well, my partner changes the baby? I said, oh, well, that's a really good question. Um, if we were living 100 years ago, yeah, probably, but we're not, so it depends really on what you think you're doing and what he thinks he's doing. Um, so the, it changes dramatically over time sometimes. So traditionally in Mi'kmaq culture, men fish for eel, uh, and women didn't. But if you look at a survey of Buckingham First Nation, a third of the women have fished for eel. Well, that's a huge difference. Uh, I don't think a third of the women are too spirit, um, but as culture becomes harder to preserve, the bits you do have become more significant. And so a lot of indigenous people are very hesitant to give up hunting traditions, even if it only happens once every five years, because the ceremonies that go with those traditions, the teachings and stories that go with those traditions, um, if you give up the practice, you'll lose all of those associated bits. And those don't get moved over if you buy food at Superstore. So I don't know anyone who does ceremony related to food they bought from a vendor. Um, but I know people who put down tobacco if they find an animal dead on the side of the road and collect parts from it. So if I find a porcupine dead and I'm going to collect some porcupine quills from it, um, that's where people would use ceremony. Um, but what happens then if everyone is getting their food from the superstore and no one is doing any traditional hunting practices, big chunks of the culture just disappear. Um, and if they're not getting renewed, if people aren't inventing new ceremony, inventing new culture, figuring out new ways to express those values and to talk to each other about it, um, then that's a problem. And so the way we sometimes police each other in indigenous communities around our identity, around authenticity, can be problematic that way because you don't want to lose any of the traditional culture then, even if it no longer matches up with the values that you might hold traditionally. So it can be really tricky. Also, the continuum, you mentioned continuum and binary, and it, it got me thinking about the continuum of being an activist. So mm -hmm. I've been a vegan for compassion for many years and part of the activist movement. But as I moved from Victoria to BC, which is very vegan friendly, to Nova mm -hmm. Scotia, <laughs> I found myself trying to encourage, of course, change with my family and friends, 
but I don't want to be too hardcore because that might not help them go vegan. So yeah. now I'm trying to figure out where do I sit with many hunters that I encounter and many friends at school, like as a teacher. Um, do I tell them you have to be vegan or maybe baby steps towards mm -hmm. it? Maybe just stop eating red meat and then stop chicken and then taste my awesome dish because I'm going to make you vegan anyway. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think I did one time to write a book chapter for some folks who were, uh, the book was all about in vitro meat, sort of the future of meat and all these meat burgers they were inventing, and uh, the idea that someday there'll be a Star Trek system where you just press the button and they'll 3D print your hamburger. Uh, and so they asked me, they said, can you write something about the Mi'kmaq and moose maybe or whatever? So I was like, all right. So I started looking into like, okay, what can I learn about in vitro meat? Um, and then I started asking myself, okay, so if the if they take the DNA of a moose that died in 2010 and they put that into the data bank and then they can just 3D print from that, what cultural relationship do the Mi'kmaq have to that moose? Well, the Mi'kmaq had a relationship with the moose, say, of mainland Nova Scotia. And as the story I told you indicates, uh, there was a particular deal there that if you didn't treat the moose respectfully, the moose would disappear you'd never see them again. Uh, well, the moose have been extinct in mainland Nova Scotia since the 1930s um, because of overhunting. So clearly the story is meant to suggest that it's partly our fault that there weren't moose here. Why are moose in Cape Breton? Uh, they trucked them in from Alberta by train um, and to restock Cape Breton. And so moose hunting continues there because they've essentially uh, stocked it with Alberta moose. And so I asked myself, well, do we actually have a relationship with those moose? Uh, so thinking about that 3D printing future, um, if the relationship between humans and animals gets uh, shaped into our, encoded into our DNA at an epigenetic level, if the interactions that we have with the environment change our DNA and the way it expresses itself, which it does, um, then yes, that relationship that you might have with an ongoing animal species would be both shaping your own culture, your own people, and their uh, actual chemical makeup, and it shapes the animals. Um, but if that species was brought in the other day from some new territory, you don't have a relationship encoded into your genetics with that animal. And so that relationship isn't present. Um, and so you would need to renegotiate or, or reinitiate that relationship. It's not all moose everywhere for all time. It's a specific group of moose that you made a particular deal with. You made a treaty with that species for that territory. Uh, and we broke that treaty and they took off. They, they all left and can come back. Uh, which for a Mi'kmaq reincarnation framework uh, leaves a mystery. Where did they go? Because uh, in a Mi'kmaq term, those moose still exist somewhere. Um, so it's, uh, it raises all kinds of new questions. Every time there's a new technological development, uh, it raises all new issues. I was talking with some folks in Sheet Harbor uh, giving a lecture about indigenous women, uh, and a bunch of women that I had grown up with, as friends of my mom, uh, came to me after the lecture and said, oh, you know, like, it turns out I also have some indigenous ancestry. And I said, oh, okay, so you know, what, what did you find out? Because to me, I grew up thinking of all the settler women. Uh, but they would tell me a little bit about their ancestry. And then I said, they said, you know, but I don't know anything about the culture. And I said, oh, well, what did your parents or grandparents teach you to cook? And so when we start talking about the food they have learned to make, that's where little bits of that culture came through. Uh, it no longer had the cultural meanings attached to it but the practices of how you go out, for instance, and harvest spittleheads, how you prepare them, what kind of dishes you make with them, that was where that kind of thing came out. Uh, and so it got me really interested in food sovereignty, issues of uh, traditional food access, uh, even questions like, when did the Scottish start putting blueberries in scones? Uh, I, I haven't been able to find the answer to that yet, but I'm really interested to find out where that started. because. Uh, the traditional Scottish scone does not have blueberries in it. <laughs> Do we have time to speak more about it? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm just curious uh, about plant-based plant foods that the Mi'kmaq 
Oh, sure. And um, also, what their relationship is, um, of course, you know, to Paul and we talked about the three sisters, and mm -hmm. I realized that that may have been, uh, been grown much more in the, you know, in the, in the central states, but not especially in the Central American indigenous cultures. But did they have three sisters here? A, mm -hmm. and B, if the uh, Bigma and um, were to move towards more countries, like, would they be more, would they be open, if, you know, uh, to like the three sisters from countries mm -hmm. like that? And what would kind of tie into their side that that could help them feel, you know, like they're following their traditions and their history, but also, you know, still it's, it's where we need to go for them. Yeah, so if I was going to do a traditional Mi'kmaq vegan diet, mm -hmm. um, I could start off with baked beans. Um, because that seemed, from, from work done with archaeologists, it seems like baked beans were a thing that they did here. Uh, they would make a clay, fire a clay pot in the soil uh, and cook the beans literally in the pot they fired into the soil. Um, so creating the fire around it, really. Um, and so the baked bean history does seem to be part of a whole region. Um, indigenous people did lots of trading, which uh, archaeology also shows, and there were particular areas that we would trade to. Um, so we didn't tend to grow corn here uh, the Mi'kmaq tend to migrate, so they go from a summer camp um, uh, along the shoreline, and in the winter they move inland and hunt bigger game animals, like moose or deer. Um, and so they shift from lots of summer with uh, seafood to then lots of winter with meat. Uh, the kind of gathering that they tended to do would be, they didn't so much farm as they uh, created the favorable circumstances under which the plants that they like to eat would grow. So uh, some areas, for instance, would get flash burned in order to stimulate the growth of blueberries, uh, which would attract bears, which uh, also fed into meat hunting practices. So uh, women tended to do plant gathering. Uh, so there's all kinds of traditional plants. So, so the uh, fiddleheads are one of the most familiar ones. Uh, but there's a bunch of different teas that you can make from different plants. Uh, there's a, actually, Dalhousie has an ethnobotanist, Jonathan Ferrier, who's uh, doing um, studies looking at how the leaves of blueberry plants contain um, chemicals that prevent and treat preeclampsia, uh, which has uh, almost no available treatments, um, but blueberry leaves seem to be doing a pretty good job. Um, so it's interesting to see the the connections between uh, particular needs people might have and the stuff that they tended to grow. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I remember reading as a kid a book about like how to survive in the woods or something, and it had a bunch of different stuff that you could eat. Um, but I, for instance, mushrooms, I do not feel, I've read enough murder mysteries to know I am not skilled enough to tell the difference between, you know, the deadly mushroom and the delicious mushroom. Uh, so. Most Mi'kmaq do not have the plant knowledge to be able to uh, harvest and collect uh, edible food from Nova Scotia anymore. There was a provincial survey done one time to preserve Mi'kmaq knowledge, and it basically found that we don't have that kind of knowledge anymore. Um, and that's what happens when you send everyone to residential school, really, uh, and teach them other stuff. The times that you would have been learning those skills uh, were occupied with other things, and the people who would have been teaching you those skills no longer had the language, vocabulary, or skill set to pass them on. Uh, so we're, we're in a really tough spot in terms of uh, being able to have elders who have any of that knowledge. Um, so the importance of preserving uh, cultural and territory specific food knowledge is only getting more and more vital. Um, because if we, if we wait another 20 years, there'll be none of it left. Um, so when people talk about preserving hunting traditions, part of that is related to that uh, enormous loss of cultural heritage that happened with residential school. Um, but some of it is also about, like, if you actually care about animals and run the math, um, it's not stopping hunting that's going to make a big difference. It's stopping factory farming. So uh, even, even if you care to stop hunting, uh, so I got invited to the Short Hills Deer Park uh, to protest the hunt there. And so I didn't know anything about the hunt, but I got invited by a vegan group in Toronto. So I did some research, and I'm like, okay. So I learned about the Haudenosaunee Treaty with the Dutch and English, and I learned about the, why they were doing it to emphasize their treaty rights to hunting in the territory and emphasize how the treaty had been broken by building all these cities. 
Uh, and then I did some research into deer hunting. Like, how many deer are they actually killing here? Okay, so it's about 30 deer a year. And then I thought, okay, well, how many deer are the settlers killing every year? Well, 45,000. Uh, I looked up how many hunting licenses do they sell, and then I figured, okay, imagine only half those people are going to the woods to drink beer with their friends. If only half those people even kill a deer, uh, although I also read things that suggest for every deer someone knows they've killed, they've also potentially injured or mortally wounded two others, um, but the, the data on that was pretty fuzzy. Based on the hard data I could find, uh, if you care about pre preventing deer deaths, uh, we should be going to Service Ontario and protesting there about all the deer hunting licenses they sell. But we weren't. And so it got me wondering, why were they so invested in stopping indigenous hunting rather than stopping settler hunting, which was clearly doing more damage? And so it made me a little suspicious about the ways in which the things that seem easiest and most obvious to do are often those things that reinforce the kind of power relations we're already pretty comfortable with, like telling other groups of people what to do. So when I see something about like, oh, we have to stop the dog meat business in China, I'm looking at it like, or we could focus that energy on stopping the meat businesses that we have here that maybe use less cute animals, um, <laughs> or animals we have been trained to perceive as less cute. So I, I'm a little hesitant before people want to get like gung-ho and we have to stop so-and-so from doing such-and-such. -such. It's like, well, let's all reflect on our own choices because <laughs> that's the one we have most control over. Uh, and it's hard enough to feel like I'm making the good choices, let alone trying to tell someone else how their choices should be made. Wow. Yes, thank you so much. Um, there's so much to think about. I'm not really sure that's like almost blowing my mind. I mean, just to think about what we want to preserve from culture, what's still serving us, what we might be able to interchange between settler culture and Mi'kmaq culture, that which we can combine to serve us better in future, to maybe have a more compassionate future and a more sustainable way of living on this planet. And uh, yeah, I think we just should keep the conversation going and uh, try to find maybe the knowledge which is maybe lost. I was actually looking for someone who could maybe do a forage hike with us or something, oh, yeah. like an indigenous person. So I have a person who does that, but he's a, a settler person. Mm -hmm. So there might be some indigenous herbs in there and so on. But of course, it would be super interesting to find someone indigenous to do that with us and to tell us about what's still growing in the forest, what we could actually forage. Yeah, I've heard the, um, the Burke Cultural Center has some pretty good people there, okay. knowledge holders. Uh, I've been, uh, one of my students actually is a knowledge holder I've been enjoying chatting with because he's been self-teaching as a way to kind of reclaim and rediscover his Mi'kmaq culture. So he knows what part of the territory his folks came from, and that's the part he lives in now. And so he's been going out and exploring the woods and learning what's there, uh, learning what you can make with it. Uh, he gave me mead for Christmas. <laughs> he's been experimenting with all kinds of different stuff you can make. Uh, it's, it is possible to reclaim it because all of that knowledge came out of long-term interaction with the territory. And the territory is still here. So if, if the territory and the animals taught us in the first place, then they can teach yeah. us again even if we, we have forgot. We exchange that contact because I'm super interested in that and in oh, sharing sure. that with other people. And uh, I think we just have to really keep our minds open and uh, consider that everyone is somewhere along the journey and that um, we all have our, I mean, almost everyone started out as a meat eater in this culture, in this society. Yeah, I was 30 years as an omnivore. I was vegan before, but uh, I, I had my second take on it now two years ago. And I have to say, I actually got my hunting license right before I went vegan. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I figured out the same as you said, uh, factory farming needs to go. And uh, I mean, that's, that's something where we have to think about how that's maybe possible and what, what we can do better in future. And I'm really glad I never exercised my hunting license and I don't think I will ever in future, but if I may be somewhere at the North Pole in an emergency situation, you never know. So I just want to keep this club really open and the mindset really open that we invite everyone, meat eaters, vegetarians, whoever is there and wherever they are on their journey 
it's really important to me. And yeah, there's so much to think about after this talk. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Margaret. And oh, thank, thank you, you for having me. I think we should just say thanks to the land, to the food we have here today to share with each other, and uh, to the creator, and to uh, say thanks to the people who prepared those foods. And I would like to just invite you all now to enjoy the potluck lunch. Thank you. Thank you.